Good morning. It is a pleasure to see you all here this morning at Lawrence Park Community Church. It is a beautiful day and a great chance for us to gather together. Some of you will have noticed that in the program there's a lot of Stephen and you're wondering where he is. I am sorry to say that Stephen's father Charles died on Friday night. He had been in palliative care for about five weeks. He had been battling prostate cancer for 17 years. And after 17 years, at 92 years old, he left. Now, Charles' family was able to be with him. They were able to spend the final days and hours with him. And Stephen was able to say all that he needed to say. He'll also be away for the rest of the week naturally as he'll be taking care of the rest of his family and if we have anything that we are to do here it's to simply lift him up and all of his family in prayer charles himself was not a religious man so there is no religious funeral service scheduled to this date however if that if a service is to come up then we will know and you will know but until then we will carry on for everyone who knows, or for everyone who is asking, my name is Reverend Roberta Howie, and I am also one of the ministers here at LPCC, and it is an honor to be with you all today. To mildly change gears, because at a church like this, we do not just celebrate life and death and life beyond death, we also celebrate those milestones with important days like baptisms. And today, we have not just one, but four baptisms for you. I'm thrilled to have uh, Judy Beauville's grandchildren, uh, Harrison and Ashton here, who will be baptized. And we also have Ali, who will be baptized. Many of you have known Ali for quite some time. He's been involved in many things, including playing percussion in the choir. And Ali and Molly's daughter, Andia, will be baptized today as well. It is an honor to be able to do so and to celebrate both life and death and life beyond death with you all. With all of this in mind, with some heavy news on our hearts and some heavy events that we have going on, I invite us to begin, as per tradition, with two deep breaths in. Let us do so in and out. And one more in and out. As we know so well, this territory is not one that Lawrence Park popped out of thousands of years ago. There is ancient history etched into the bedrock, grown into the trees, sung into the wind, 
including those who have tended and cared for this land for thousands of years, well before settlers arrived. Here, done with the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, we have different indigenous groups, including the Haudenosaunee, including the Petun and Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. They call us to be in reconciliation, to care and share this land peacefully, and we continue to do so. With all of this in mind, let us prepare to lift up our hearts as we sing our opening hymn together, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Let us greet one another, sharing the peace of Christ with each other as has been done for centuries and we continue to do so now. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please take a moment and share with, if you're online, feel free to unmute yourselves. And if you're in person, feel free, fist bump, elbows, hearty handshake, whatever floats your boat. As we gather, I have a wee little question. Does anyone see something different up here? I know I'm different from Stephen, but there's something else up here. The font. the font, yes. I have no trick questions for you today. This is our baptismal font, right? It's been a few months since we've had a baptism and it's always an opportunity for us to gather and to celebrate when someone says that they are part of God's community, that they are loved and beloved, and that we get to welcome that and celebrate that. And I have a question as well. Who remembers their baptism? Who rem okay, some people remember their baptism, yes. If you remember your baptism, how old were you when you were baptized? Just shout it out. We got seven, we got 40s. We got 45. Here I was gonna shock you all saying I was 18 when I was baptized and here you are shocking me and saying, aha, nice try. I think sometimes when we talk about baptisms, we think that it really is for everyone that's like a little baby, right? Very, very small. But baptism is an opportunity for us at any age. There's no such thing as too old or too young. There's no such thing as asking too many questions or too few questions, too sure, too unsure. Simply wanting to be 
in a community of hopeful believers is enough to open the door. This is why we get to celebrate today with people of all ages coming from near and far, and we are thrilled to be able to do so. The sacrament of baptism proclaims and celebrates the grace of God. By water and the Spirit, we are called, claimed, and commissioned. We are called by God's own, welcomed as children of God. We are claimed by Christ, united with Christ, united with one another, and the Christian community of every time and place. We are commissioned to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice, and strengthened by the Holy Spirit for the work of the church in the world. I invite Laura Lane to come forward and say a few words. Is this on? No. Oh. Is this on? Yes. Okay. On behalf of the congregation of Lawrence Park Community Church, I present the following persons for the initiation into the body of Christ through baptism. Do I read the rest of them? Yeah, say their names. Oh, okay. Harrison John and Ashton Edward Gersh. Ash Harrison and Ashton live with their mother, Lindy, in Utah. They love sports, including skiing and also seeing themselves online. <laughs> Le Lindy, the mother, was baptized at LPCC and came up through Sunday school. So to be baptized here is a very meaningful moment for the entire family. And then Al Alarisa and, and Andia, Ayu Yusuf. In 2023, Ali and his wife Molly were looking for a church to call their home. They found us at LPCC and immediately knew they were home with us. Ali grew in his faith with many conversations with members of the church, with participating in the choir, we all know his drum, and with Reverend Stephen. Andia was born this summer and it is an honor to be able to present both Ali and Andia and father and daughter for baptism. That's it. Now the trick is to take the lid off the font without breaking it. I'm afraid Stephen did not give instructions for that, which is quite rude. <laughs> there we go. Now I'm going to ask some questions, and so I'm going to invite the Gersh family to come forward first, so we can ask you. <laughs> and I invite their godparents to come forward as well. If they're in yes. We have to put some water in there, my friend. Yeah. It's quite all right. So first, I'll be asking these questions of Lindy, and then I have one question for both Ashton and Harrison, okay? Lindy, do you believe in God's source of love, in Jesus Christ, love incarnate, and in the Holy Spirit, love's power? If so, please say, I do by the grace of God. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ, resisting oppression and evil, seeking justice, and witnessing to God's love for all creation. If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. I will, God being my helper. Thank you. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. I will, God being my helper. In baptism, both Harrison and Ashton mark an important step in their journey of faith. Will you care for them and help them take their place within the mission of Christ's church? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. I have a question for the godparents. Recognizing that many persons nurture and influence the life of a child, will you support these children and their parents as they grow in faith? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. For Harrison and for Ashton, one question. Oh, thank you. Do you promise to always ask questions all the time? Yeah. yeah. 
If so, can you please say, I will, God being my helper. Thank you. I invite you to have a seat. And if I can have Ali and Andia and Molly and all of your family come forward. I am going to ask Ali first, and that way when you answer for Andia, then it's coming from your chest, you know? Ali, do you believe in God, source of love, in Jesus Christ, love incarnate, and in the Holy Spirit, love's power? If so, please say, I do, by the grace of God. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ, resisting oppression and evil, seeking justice, and witnessing to God's love for all creation? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. Thank you. Now I have some questions for you both as Auntie's parents. For both of you together, do you believe in God, source of love in Jesus Christ, love incarnate, and in the Holy Spirit, love's power? If so, please say, I do, by the grace of God. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ, resisting oppression and evil, seeking justice, and witnessing to God's love for all creation? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. And finally, in baptism, Andia marks an important step in her journey of faith. Will you care for her, and above all, help her to take her place within the mission of Christ Church? If so, please say, I will, God being my helper. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Just right there. And now, for the entire congregation, we have a question that's going to be posed on the screen for us all. Because as we know, baptism is not just between the person being baptized, the water and God, it is with the community at large. And now, for you all, one question. As the congregation, family, and friends of Harrison and Ashton, of Andia and Ali, do you agree to help them all grow in their Christian faith, to help them learn and experience love and compassion, and to resist evil and oppression, if so, say together, we will, God being our helper. Thank you. As we know with baptism, there's one important part that is the water. The water is the symbol of new life, is the symbol of healing streams. It is the reminder that God is the source of all life, and in being baptized, we are welcomed into new life. In blessing this water as a community, we symbolize and acknowledge the importance of doing so together, of remembering our own baptisms and remembering what they mean to us all. For this, I invite you to say the words that are on the screen. The words in bold are yours. God be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to God. As Christ was baptized in the River Jordan, as we find new life in each source of water and in each miracle before us, this water we bless in the name of the Holy Spirit that moves for us all with the strength of God's love and with the wonderful journey given to us by Jesus Christ. Amen. I am going to invite Harrison and Ashton to come forward first. Would you like to come forward with your mom? Okay. Now, before I put any water on your head, would you like to touch the water? Yeah. 
See, not too cold. No. There. Here. Who's coming up first? It's all right. That's quite all right, darling. Ashton Gersh, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With these waters, I make the sign of the cross as a reminder of the loving parent of us all. Just like that. Who's next? I, I'm glad you like water. Mm. Harrison, right? Just double. Mr. Harrison, with this water, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I make the sign of the cross on you as a reminder of the loving parent of us all. Amen. All done? If I may have Ali and Andia come forward, please. Yeah. Molly, if you'd like to come forward, please do so. Now, who first? Andia. Andia first? You got it. <laughs> It's not that cold. Yeah, I know. Andia, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. With this water, I make the cross as a reminder of the blessing from the eternal parent. Amen. There. And Allie? With this water, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. With this water, I make the sign of the cross as a reminder of the blessing from the eternal parent. Amen. For all of you here, may the blessing of the one God, the mother and father of us all, be on you today, now and forever, as you bear the sign of Jesus Christ. Laura. Oh. This is what we're going to do. Here, it's okay. On behalf of LPCC, we present you with these candles to help the children know the light of Christ in your home. As we are all children of God, everyone will get one and a certificate so that you remember this day from this day forward. But for now, for all of us here, we celebrate in song. And so I invite, if you wish, you're welcome to, uh, take your children around the congregation so they could say hello. I know that you might be interested, you might not be. Andia, if you're interested, I think everyone would like to say hello to you as well. Congratulations to you all.
there is child care, and there is Sunday school where Sarah has some fun games and activities. Feel free to go, and we'll see you at the end of the service. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from the book of Job. Now, this part of the story of Job is quite different from what we learned in Sunday school. In Sunday school, the focus was on the argument between Satan and God about the love of and loyalty to God of Job even after all his loss of wealth and health. So it's Job 8, 18, verses 1 to 15, sorry, Job 38. It's a dramatic and pivotal moment in the book of Job where God responds to Job out of a whirlwind. Up until this point, Job has been lamenting his suffering and questioning God's justice, while his friends have offered various explanations for his plight. However, in this passage, God finally speaks directly to Job, but instead of answering Job's questions, he challenges him with a series of questions that highlight God's wisdom, power, and the vastness of creation. God speaks to Job from a storm, often referred to as a whirlwind. This suggests a powerful, overwhelming force, emphasizing God's majesty and the awe-inspiring nature of his presence. In these verses, God poses a series of rhetorical questions to Job. These questions highlight the gap between God's infinite knowledge and human understanding. The verses describe elements of the natural world and cosmos, the earth's foundations, the sea, the morning light and darkness, to emphasize God's control over all of creation. It reminds Job that human beings, including Job, cannot grasp the full works of the universe. Thank you. Job 38, verses 1 to 15, and Job 39 to 41. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. God said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace thyself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together. And all the angels shouted for joy. It's hard not to cry this morning with all this joy. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. 
Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the, the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wake in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Here ends the lesson. However, in the next verse, Job's, Job's explanation or understanding of the message of Christ uh, is received. Job is very positive about it, and uh, he uh, is loyal and loving of God and expresses that. And in the very end, his wealth and health are restored. It's a complicated book. There's many things that I'm grateful for. One of them is having a co-minister that will write his sermon much earlier in the week so that I don't have to make it within four hours. And so this is Stephen's sermon, and he asked if I would read it on his behalf. So if there's anything in here that is either confusing or frustrating or you don't like, assume it's one of my ad-libs or edits. And if it's a brilliant, poignant moment, assume it's Stevens, and you should be all right. This month has seen many whirlwinds devastate areas of the southern United States. Hurricane Helene wreaked devastation in September, destroying and damaging thousands of buildings. Then, with hardly any time to recover, Hurricane Milton, no family relation, arrived cutting across Florida between Tampa and Miami, wreaking havoc once more. Meteorologists had seen both storms coming and warned citizens to evacuate. What homeowners did not expect was that areas would not be affected by the hurricane would be attacked by tornadoes, which are a side effect of the massive storm. At least 41 whirlwinds tore through communities ripping apart many homes far from the hurricane. At the beginning of the book of Job, it is a whirlwind sent by Satan that destroys the home where Job's children are feasting. The house falls on top of them, killing them all. To Job, the whirlwind has caused him the greatest pain. He understands all too well the terrible, deadly power of a tornado. So when he demands an audience with God, as we saw last week, he must be terrified when God shows, us in the, shows up in the form of a whirlwind, the very force that killed his family. It is a hovering tornado from which God's voice emerges as he finally replies to Job. God's first words are anything but consoling. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God asks, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I put the stars in their places, when I created the seas and told them to stop at the shore? God's reply to Job sounds utterly intimidating. All this time, Job had wished for an audience with God. He begged, demanded one a chance to find out why he lost all his wealth, his children were killed in a whirlwind, why his body is covered in painful boils. Yet, when God finally replies, he doesn't give the kind of answer Job expects. God's first words seem designed to tell Job that he has no right to question anything. God does or decides. 
God seems to be saying, you have no right to ask anything of me, you lowly human. Who are you? That is profoundly unsatisfying, and it makes God appear to be a harsh father figure who's only interested in flaunting his own power. Not at all what we hope God would be like, but a closer reading of what God says reveals greater dimensions of the meaning to the voice from the whirlwind. For God does not simply tell Job to be quiet. God has paid close attention to Job's words and replies to quite precisely to his complaint. When Job first expressed his lament for his suffering, he cursed the day he was born. He wished the sun had never risen on that day, and that night he had been conceived had never taken place. In Job's hands, nature itself would have wiped out a day and a night so he could have never existed. When God replies to Job, the reply starts where Job started, with the sun and darkness, but God's perspective is very different, as seen up here. Have you commanded this morning place since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Earth is changed like clay under the seal and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked and their uplifted arm is broken. In God's description, when dawn breaks, it reveals the mountains and the valleys of the earth, the way clay responds to the pressing of a steel or a stamp. The highest ridges appear first. Then, as when dawn's light finds the mountain tops first, then God implies that nighttime is the domain for the wicked. This is when they steal, they murder with upstretched arms. It is the coming of the dawn that cuts their evil time short. When Job imagined this being in charge of the universe, the sun would not rise, his birth would never happen. But God counters that in God's hands. Dawn is always a time of blessing, a relief from evil. God carries on with this theme of the divine care for the universe. God decides when the dry ground needs new rain, where the oceans shall stop at the shore. God tells Job that it is God who feeds the hungry ravens and the famished lions. A few lines after today's reading, God makes a point of saying that there are beasts in the wilderness that are terrifying to human beings, but whom God loves and cares for. This is perhaps the most striking aspect about God's message for Job. Nature was not designed for human beings. It was never made for us. God delights in speaking of the majestic beauty and fearful strength of the Leviathan and the behemoth, two enormous, terrifying monsters, one in the sea and one on land. In God's answer to Job, we are here very clearly we hear that this universe was not made with only humans in mind. There are many, many species that humans may never meet, may never know of, but God knows and sees and loves them all. In our time, we need this reminder. As hurricanes and wildfires ravage the earth, we're told by scientists that human beings are the cause of the increased pace of these natural disasters. Climate change is the cause, largely through the burning of fossil fuels. Our reaction has been to avoid responsibility and action. In Florida, which was battered by two hurricanes in a single month, the state passed a law banning the word climate change from appearing in its legislation. Like magic, they solved it. In Congress, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has accused Democrats of, accu of using technology to create the hurricanes to attack Republican voting areas. 
Cool, Stephen. Cool. Meanwhile, among more sober minds, scientists have seriously suggested renaming our, ge our geological epoch to the Anthropocene, the age when humans took charge of the Earth. Our actions have clearly affected the weather, and we can expect more fierce hurricanes as the oceans warm up. More devastating fires can be expected as parched forests dry out. But does this mean we're in charge? The God of the Book of Job would disagree. This is still God's universe, created with a careful system of checks and balances which scientists still struggle to understand. Climate change is real, an assault on God's creation, but we got here by thinking we're in charge of the first place and we can do what we wanted. The book of Job presents a God whose creation is still too complicated, too mysterious, too powerful to fully understand. The book of Job implies that we had shown, that had we shown more humility in our approach to nature, we would not be in this situation in the first place. And it seems unlikely that pretending we're fully in charge now is going to get us out of this mess either. Nature and God deserve our respect and awe and even fear. Job wanted a straight answer from God and Job suffered from losing his wealth and his health and all of his family, and as so, his view of life narrowed. He demanded that God drop all that God was doing and give Job an audience. Job had become self-absorbed. God's answer to Job can be seen as a compassionate rebuke. Where Job was self-obsessed, God responds with a cosmic vision of the universe designed to blow Job's mind wide open. God's refusal to answer Job's narrow question of why me is exactly what he needs, a chance to see the world from God's point of view. It is the antidote to the narrow, self-focused prison caused by Job's suffering. The message that God, that Job, the message to Job is that the cure to your suffering is not just the cure of your boils, but a change of mind. In fact, the change of mind comes first. See the world even a little more from my perspective, God says, and your bitterness and your selfishness will melt away. That may be a message for our civilization too. The more we think we are in charge, the more bitter we become. Embrace wonder and awe, even entertain a healthy fear of storms, and we may be able to see the way forward. The book of Job suggests that there is wisdom in the voice of the whirlwind, if we are willing to listen. Amen.
holiest of holies, as we give gratitude and welcome new members into our family and this community, we also know that there is pain. We lift up Stephen as he grieves the loss of his father. May Stephen and Amanda know that they are nurtured and comforted here. We lift up the heart and spirit of Charles James Milton to know that he is at peace, to know that he is loved, We lift up all of the family and all of their loved ones in the name of the source of love. Amen. Thank you all. We always say just a few announcements. One day it will be true. All of our weekly events are going on this week. There will be Wednesday afternoon prayer. I'll be leading that this week. The one thing that has been uh, canceled will be the Taze service. That was supposed to be this Wednesday. That will be postponed till a later date, and we'll keep you posted on when that will be. But for everything else, we have meditation, pole fitness, coffee talk, prayer time, tai chi is all on, and you can find more info, I believe, in the bulletin. There's a little handout with some of the upcoming events. And we look forward to seeing you at all of them. And yes, as soon as we know for the 23rd when that'll happen, we will let you know. There is a pulpit swap that will be here next week where everyone in the North Toronto cluster has the opportunity to switch pulpits. So Stephen will not be here this time for good reason. He'll be preaching at North Lee which is a nearby congregation, and their minister, Reverend Liz McKenzie, will be with us next week. I've heard Liz and worked with Liz many times over the years. She is a crackerjack of a woman. You're going to have a great time. For October 29th, as you can see, uh, going back one, uh, there's the All Candidates Meeting on Housing and Homelessness at LPCC. We have invited many of the candidates to come here and uh, answer some questions that we have around both affordable housing, working on housing and houselessness issues. And uh, if you have any questions, I invite you to email them to Stephen. He will look at them. He is still planning to moderate. We're not and trying to figure out how we're going to ask how, I forget how many candidates, it's a lot, but we're going to make sure that they all get the opportunity to address how they would deal with housing. So if you have any questions, please email Stephen and he'll figure out how to present them to all the candidates. November 1st is the Canadiana concert, including our very own Dennis, who was here 10 seconds ago. I believe he just ran out the door for his next gig. Thanks, we'll figure it out. You'll see him definitely on November 1st. It is Canadiana concert, so all forms of Canadian music. You want it, it will be played. It is November 1st, 7.30 here. You can find either the tickets will be sold in person here or they'll be sold online as well. And next is um, Amanda's Camino trip. As you know, Amanda, Stephen's wife and partner, has, went on the Camino trip over the summer. She wants to talk about it. And this is the chance to talk about it because everybody and, their, and her cousin has been asking. Yes, she has all 10 toes still. No, she did not get a ridiculous sunburn. Yes, she's happy to answer literally any other question. And you can ask them after church on November 3rd. That is not all that we have going on, but it is just a slice of it. If you want to make sure that all of this programming continues to go on and that you have the opportunity to be seen and to see others, please feel free to donate to the church. You can do so online. We also take check and credit card. All of the proceeds go towards maintaining the building, programming, and making sure that our staff are well compensated for their work. Speaking of staff, as you'll know, that Stephen will be away this week, but if there's any pastoral care concerns, I will be available. I'll be in the office on Wednesday and Thursday and available by email throughout the rest of the week. And we look forward to seeing Stephen back sometime soon. 
all of this and more, let us lift up our hearts in the final hymn for today, Teach Me God to Wonder. As we go out into the world today, I also know many of us have questions and answers uh, we're seeking. And so a reminder afterwards, if you wish to hash it out together after you get your cup of tea or coffee, please join us in the back where we have our post-sermon discussion. And you'll be more than welcome to look at Stephen's sermon as well. And we can figure out together some of those answers and questions. As we go out into the world today, we know that we're called to do one thing and one thing only, love unconditionally. Be known, know that we are loved, know that we're capable of this loving, and know that we are called to do so by the God that has called us by our name. Until we see each other again, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>